Okay. <coughs> the last uh, lecture we started setting up a problem. I decided that I'm not going to cover any more new material, but just do problems this week. And if you have any specific problems that you would like me to discuss in class, please send them to me. And uh, we'll we'll talk about them. Otherwise, I'll just pick up problems from various texts and uh, outline the solution procedure. Um, I did put the last assignment, number eight, which is, I'm, I'm not, I guess I should call it an assignment, it's not due. Um, but I would strongly encourage each one of you to make sure that you understand how to do those. Uh, I'm not guaranteeing one of those two questions will be there, but one of those types of questions will be there. Root locus and uh, uh, root criteria. Particularly the second problem is a challenging one. If you are seeing it for the first time in an exam, I'm not sure whether you will see through on how to do that. So give that some thought before the exam. Okay. Uh, the problem, I think, if I has anybody looked at those problems? I think only one person I know has looked at the problem. It's basically to construct the root locus diagram for a problem where KT is not changing, but one of the other parameters, I think in that particular problem, tau D is changing continuously. So we need to reformulate the problem in such a way that uh, you have tau D as a continuous parameter that changes continuously uh, before you can pass to, for example, R locus or a program like that. So it needs a slight reformulation. So I will give you a chance to think about it, and uh, maybe in the last lecture on Friday, I will outline how the solution might look like for that. Yeah. Uh, you, you, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you are looking for a physical interpretation of what tau D does. Uh, you can think of it in the following way. What in the proportional action you are saying that the control action is going to be proportional to the error. Right? In the integral action you are saying it's going to be proportional to the area under the error curve up to a certain point. Okay? That's what integration does. It accumulates all the errors or up, up to a certain time. That is what gives you the ability to drive the uh, offset to zero in the integral action. So in the same way, what does the derivative action do? The derivative action looks at the rate of change of the error with respect to time. Okay, so it can speed up the response. It says, oops, the error is going too fast. Not only what is the absolute level of the error at a particular time, which is what the proportional action will take care of, but this one says, the error is going up or down at a certain rate. So it gets an estimate of how fast the error is changing. So it's going to construct your response in proportion to the rate of change. So it would be even more aggressive than increasing k simply. But it is looking at, uh, it's aggressive in both ways. When the error is increasing, it's going to say, okay, I'm going to, uh, for example, plan the break faster to bring it down. But if at the same time that the error is going down at a rapid rate, say, so okay, the error is going down at a rapid rate, I can relax. I don't have to uh, activate the control action. So in that sense, it is using the instantaneous rate of change of the error. And so it is aggressive in both ways. While increasing, it will try to counter the rate of increase. While decreasing, it will say, okay, it's decreasing too fast. I can relax on the control action that I need to take. So that's one way of looking at it. Think about it and then, yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, so the problem that we saw in the last class is uh, actually taken from the one of the books. In fact, I'll show, throw up that problem page from the book uh, because I've kind of expanded on it. Uh, this is really too small, isn't it? Can I blow it up? Okay. 
14 6 is a uh, this is a book that I particularly like in control system because when I learned control system I use this textbook. It's really an old one, okay? But they've come up with a recent edition and this is the only book I've come so so far that integrates MATLAB nicely with uh, the the topic. Uh, so I kind of rediscovered this when I started teaching control only a few years ago. So this uh, this uh, this problems are from that particular book. So fourteen six simply says draw the root of this diagram for the control system shown in fourteen six. Determine the value of KC needed to obtain a root of the characteristic equation of the closed loop response, which has an imaginary part of point seven five. Okay, uh, maybe they haven't solved the problem because they have not posted. It, I think to give you the clue. Uh, so by reading this, I would say, okay, there is a value of KC at which uh, the root, the imaginary part of the root is 0.75. I can go after it. I um, will discuss this a bit more. Okay, and then says so using the value of KC found in part A, determine all the other roots of the characteristic equation. So we need to answer the question then first, how many roots are there, and then how do I go about it? And then for unit inputs, uh, find out the actual response. Uh, so I took this problem, the same block diagram, but kind of rephrase these questions. Okay, so if you go back to the notes, um, you find the same diagram, a, um, a PI controller uh, with two transfer functions in series with a feedback loop. Okay, there is nothing in the measurement lag. So I first let's build a similar model and try a KC of one and see what you can learn about the response. Is it stable or unstable? This is not the right way to find out the work stability because you need to try different values. So this, the, the, the root locus method, the root criterion are much better methods to find the stability. So let's do that. So um, I'm going to first um, map the simulant representation and uh, there it is. Okay, when I open up control block, I put KC and three times KC for proportional integral action. So this similar link is constructed based on a given problem. And I need to define what KC is, and I've been asked to use KC equal to one. Okay. And now I can run the simulation and then plot the response. So this is what I get. So what can you say from that response? Is it stable or not? For that value of KC, it's unstable. Okay? It's growing up. You can see the axis there. It's 10 to the 9 on the y-axis. So it's really, the thing looks like it's a kind of constant, but simply not true, simply because the scale is so large. But it takes a long time, over 20 minutes or so, but before it completely goes up. So for KC equal to 1, it is an unstable System. So we need to find the value of KC where it is stable. Okay. So the first part is fairly easy. The second part is the one that's going to be requiring us to analyze it in great detail. Okay. So let's read the second part. It says determine the value. It actually should be the values of KC. We need to obtain a root of the characteristic equation of the closed loop response, which is which has an imaginary part that is equal to 0.75. So we construct the open loop trans uh, uh, transfer function, which is the product of all the three transfer functions, and you see that written here. Okay, so it is written as a ratio of a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator. So that is the key, a clue also to your second problem in your current assignment, and it has a multiplication factor. So our local program requires you to identify the numerator and the denominator of the transfer function. It takes the product as a gain and it scans all values of the gains and plus the root of this equation, 1 plus g equal to 0. So if you look at, if you remember from the R locus uh, explanation, this is how it was. So g is there and then there was k in the feedback loop, and it is going to take k and change the values of k. 
So your trick for the second problem in your assignment or variations on it would be I ask you to do it for tau d, variation in tau d or variation in tau i. You need to recast the problem in this particular format. Okay? Then in our case, it is simply a proportional k. Kc is the one that is going to change. Tau i is given, constant number. Okay? So we need to generate a root locus diagram in MATLAB that will take this g and then give us the diagram. Okay? So I have written a script, and I, this is a fairly long script. And I want to go through that in detail so that you understand the programming. Okay. I will put a copy of both of them on the yeah, Moodle. Okay. So this is the script that is going to construct the open loop transfer function within MATLAB using symbolic toolbox, and then plot me for uh, the particular value of KP, the root locus here. I'm going to set a breakpoint, and can you read from the back? Can everybody read that? So take a minute and go through that and ask me questions. If there is any part that is not clear to you. Now, when you're doing a problem of this type, I don't expect you to remember all the commands, but uh, you should be able to find out using the help. There are a number of commands that we have used. We've seen it before, num bin, for example, on 9-11. What does that do? And uh, what am I doing in line 18? What is the overall objective? That's the first thing you should have in your mind. The overall objective is to construct a transfer function object in MATLAB, which is what the root locus, R locus function in line uh, 19 requires. Yeah. Oh, you can name it anything you want. It has to be a transfer function object, okay? So it, you can name it T O T F O B J. It's a name. You can name it anything that you want. Okay? But you have to define it before. Okay? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Good question. Is it doing anything there? It's redundant. Okay? The sub, what does subs do in general? If you have a numerical value, just to substitute the numerical value into a symbolic expression. But I have already defined all the numerical values there. So if you look at G before and after, you, you don't have any numerical substitution. So the simplify rearranges it. You could rearrange it as a ratio of polynomials. So your point is well taken. The sub is not needed there. Any other questions? I want you to focus up to line 19, and then we will uh, run it step by step. Yeah? Initially, KC is symbol. At this line, 2 KC is defined as a symbol. So in line 4, KC will remain as a symbol. So GC will remain as a symbolic expression. But, and in line 10 also, I will show you, uh, GC will remain, uh, KC will remain as a symbol in G. Okay, but only in um, uh, line 12, I'm defining KC to be 1, and then subs will substitute. I do mean at uh, line 14, but not in line 10. In line 10, it is redundant. That was the question. What is it doing in line 10? It's not really doing anything. Let's kind of step two line by line and see what it is doing. Okay, so I set up a breakpoint at line two. So I now executed line one, which is clear the workspace. Okay, I'm stepping through. So I'm going to now show you what GC looks like inside the workspace. It's KC times three over S plus one. That's what was given GC. Okay, and so KC as a symbol here. 
have one more line, and you can define how G1 looks like. G1 is 2 divided by S over 2 plus 1. Okay? And what symbolic processing did, converted 0.5 as a symbol, 1 over 2 as a ratio of numbers, okay? uh, integer numbers. So now you should look at G. G will be the open loop transfer function. So it is multiplied everything, and you see KC as a symbol and S. Okay? But it has not factored it as numerator and denominator. So it simply uh, appears as a product. So simplify is the one that is going to do. So this is how G looks before. After I execute that, that line, G still looks like that. <laughs> okay, so this num then that takes the same expression G and sorts out the numerator and denominator of that expression. Okay? So the purpose of num then is to take any symbolic expression and check and see whether you can separate the numerator and the denominator and produce two symbolic expressions. So num is one of the outputs and den is another output. Both of them are going to be symbolic expressions, but one will be from the numerator of g, the other one will be from the denominator of g. Okay? So now you can look at num with 16 kc times f plus 3. And then is s times s plus 2 times s square plus 2 s plus 2. It still shows you the factor of form, but that is the denominator of that expression. So now I'm setting kc is equal to 1. And then they substitute into num because num at this stage is still a symbolic expression before execution. But after execution, I'm storing the result as num n to indicate that it's just a numerical one. These are all, anything on the left hand side, you give it a name. You can give any name that you want. But use it consistently after that. Okay. So num now is 16s plus 48. So kc has been substituted. kc has been removed from that expression. Okay. And dn again would be the denominator polynomial. And still, both are symbolic expressions in S. So polynomial in S, a linear polynomial in S, and uh, the denominator is a fourth degree polynomial, a quartic polynomial. So the next one, sum to poly, takes the polynomial and extracts the numerical part of it. Okay. So now we look at num c. These are the coefficients of the numerical coefficients of the polynomial, one and three. Ah, the question. Sixteen k c there, right? So I'm just trying to take the 16 out so that what MATLAB will get is that combined factor k. What I'm calling k in MATLAB, the gain will be 16 times kc. The plot will be scaled by that, uh, it doesn't change the plot. The value of k on the graph will change. Right? Yeah. Okay, so now I have formulated the numerical, uh, the numerator and denominator coefficients in num c and don c. This is the first degree polynomial, so there are five coefficients. Okay, now I'm passing that to tf. tf is the one that creates the transfer function object using polynomials uh, in the numerator and denominator. So once I execute that, I will have tf as an object. It's a transfer function object. If you want to look at the transfer function object, I can go and see uh, transfer function object. That's all it's just telling me. <laughs> How do I get this TF printed out? Mm. There it is. I changed the name. <laughs> right? TF object. So this is the transfer function. Use is reconstructed that using the coefficients. That should have been an easier way to convert any symbolic expression into a transfer function object. But so far, I have not found that. <laughs> okay. Um, now I'm going to execute the R locus function, and then we'll go back to the problem of uh, where is your root locus plot. 
So the question is find out those values of Kc where the imaginary part, I don't care what the real part is, the imaginary part should be equal to 0.75. Now if I had asked the question beforehand, would you be able to answer how many such values are likely to be? You cannot. So did you have a question? Yeah. What do you mean? I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to change this number here and see that it changes completely. To answer this question, uh, how, how many such values are likely to be, you cannot until you generate the plot. Now that you generate the plot, you can, for example, uh, I'm going to enter a command and see uh, whether you can identify what that command will do. Plot minus 4 to 1, comma 0.75, 0.75. What does it do? Yeah. Uh, it should be equal to 0.75. It's a plot command. So it's plotting. What does the plot command do typically? X, comma, Y. It takes a set of vectors X, set of vectors Y, and connects them point by point. So here, it's going to connect one point, which is at minus 4, 0.75. To another point which is at x equal to 1, y equal to 0.75. So it's going to draw a horizontal line okay, on that graph. Oops, I made a mistake. What mistake did I make? <laughs> I drew that line, but I lost the previous one. <laughs> okay, let me just hold on. And then R to locus. Okay. So all I've done is to help my eye, I've just drawn a line where the imaginary part is likely to be 0.75. I'm drawing it at now. Now how many such values of k are there? Four such values of k are there, right? Um, is it always the case? And he said that the graph looks always the same. Okay. Let's go and change. Suppose I'm having a different problem, okay? Different problem where k is 1.5. What are the coefficients in the uh, transfer function? 1.5, okay? And uh, I'm going to now get rid of this because we've gone through this and run it. So, problem is different. I'm just changing numbers slightly and let us see what, what the root locus looks like. So it will repeat it all the way up to that. Oops. Yeah, I want oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to generate that, right? Thank you. I need to <laughs> Thank you very much. So there it is. Okay. Now if I ask you the question, how many values of k are there where the imaginary part is 0.75? There's no value of kc for which the imaginary part is 0.75. Okay. So the root locus graph will change depending on the coefficients in your polynomial, depending on the transfer function, depending on the system that you are studying. Okay. So it may not have the same structure all the time. Okay. So you could have, uh, that answers your question, right? You could have different um, values. And this would change if I keep, for example, tau i. I can superpose plus for different values of tau i or different values of tau, uh, tau d. Okay. So uh, let's go back to that value and continue to study the script. Okay. So let's just do this. Okay, so I know that there are four values, right? So the next question is, what is the value of Kc at which this is exactly equal to 0.75? The imaginary part is exactly equal to 0.75. And we know that it is, there are four values, okay? So how do I get approximately where those are? If you're interested in running an approximate value, just click somewhere around it. So when the gain is 47.7, it says the imaginary part is 0.625. 
that's not what you want. Mm -hmm. It depends on how skillfully you can control those and hit exactly 0.75. This is 33.3, okay? And imaginary side is 0.757, close enough, okay? And at the same location on the horizontal line, if you go and click there, 0.769, but the gain is 5.5. So there is another value of k around 5 where you can get 0.75. There's one value around 33 where you can get. Now, the, uh, so, so there are four of them. So we, we can decide uh, which one we are going to go after. Okay, any questions on that? So you cannot answer how many such values will be a priori, but once you construct the root locus, you can say, okay, I know now there are four values. I can go after them exactly. Let me ask you another question, which is again not in the problem, that for any such value, how many roots will be there? Suppose I pick this value, okay, uh, gain of 37.1, around that there is uh, one root with an imaginary part close to 0.75. How many other roots will be there? Right, you have answered more than what I asked. <laughs> uh, my question was, uh, let's make sure that everybody understands the question. How many, uh, how many, okay, how many roots will there be for this problem for a given value of k? How do you know that answer to that question? Degree of the denominator. This is a polynomial of fourth degree. So for any value of k that you pick, you must have four values. Okay. So it's the degree of the denominator that this, this determines how many such um, roots you will have. So for a particular root that you have picked, there will be three other roots. And as we pointed out, it has, because it is complex already, there must be another root uh, with a negative imaginary part. And we already see that because it's symmetric. Okay. So for a root like this, there will be a corresponding root at the bottom. I cannot click exactly on that, but there is one. Okay, and uh, similarly in this case, all four are complex, so there will be two pairs of imaginary uh, roots for that particular value of k. The next question that you have to ask answer is: Okay, this, for this root, can you tell me that the system is going to be stable? You don't know what the other roots are. Okay. There may be a root for the same value of k that you are seeing here, 37. There may be a root that is on the right hand side. You don't know. Okay. So you need to find out all the four roots for a given value of k before you can answer that question. So in the remaining part of the code, we are going to go after answering these questions. Okay. The coding gets a bit complicated. Um, I'm not sure whether I should apologize or I should not. Challenge you. <laughs> for some of you, it is easy. For some of you, it is incomprehensible. So I want you to take a look at it and put up your hand if you think that it's, you, don't, you don't understand the big picture and you don't understand the details. I want you to focus from line 21 to 31. I'm going to sort of repeat the same thing for. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to get into trouble. I don't want to change everywhere. I'll just change that to this. You can do that. You okay. can do that. Um, what you need to do is not in a nice tablet to the format degree, but the information that you are asking, you can get by doing this. Come on, tonight. Pardon me? The TF object, I can. Still there, right? Yeah, yeah, this should work. 
So what I'm trying to illustrate is all locus takes an additional second parameter, which I picked at 29 in this case, for example. That is the value of k for which I want all locus to compute the roots and return. Okay? So it says, okay, as the value of k equals 29, the roots are the following. Okay? Now you can do this, 29 to 31. So it's going to take 29, 30, 31, three values. And these are the roots. Okay? So by looking at this table, what can you tell? For example, I'm looking for imaginary part of 0.75, right? So here for 29 is 0.78. 30 it is 0.781. It's decreasing. 31 it is 0.775. So I need to keep searching in that direction. Okay? So instead of doing all the complicated programming that I've shown earlier, you could take the shortcut and say, okay, let me do this for 36. Okay? So now narrow it down. Where is it? I, I would think that this is probably for 36. This is for 35. And that is for 34. So somewhere between 34 and 35, it has crossed that point all time. So from an engineering point of view, you can say I'm happy with that answer. So I will take the value of that k, 30, 34 and 35, 34.5. Let's put it out. Okay, but MATLAB allows you to go after this number to as many precisions as you want, as many digits as you want. And that's what that piece of code does. Okay? Real and stable, yes. That's very good. It will be unstable for all those values of k. Okay. So this particular frequency, if you want to operate it, it's not going to be possible because it's going to be unstable. Okay. Any other questions? Good question. What do you think it might do? Guess, take a guess. <laughs> Now, to understand, if somebody gives you a piece of code, how do you understand, how do you make sense of what it does? Okay. This is because of the interactive nature of MATLAB, you can break it down into parts and execute it on the command window and understand what it does. So I'm going to show you the process so that you can have a tool for learning um, this thing on your own. Now I need to save this. I made the change to this, run it again. Pick a point and then okay. So I did the search graphically and I found out that somewhere between 29 and 36 there is a value change. Okay, so point on five occurs somewhere in between. So in line 21, what I'm saying is I'm going to start searching from 29 to 36 in steps of one. So k min is my minimum value of the search, k max is my maximum value of the search. K step is the cut increment. Then I use that R locus command in exactly the way that I just pointed out. Using K min, return me the roots. Okay? So I'm going to just step through this one by one and show you what happens. Okay? So let me execute that. So K is 29 and R are these four values. There are four roots, so these are the four values. The next line is a complicated line. Would anybody try to kind of guess what I'm trying to do? For grammar. <laughs> So the, it, it is kind of like English in terms of when you why is all absolute imaginary part greater than 0 0.001? Keep doing that. Okay? Now, why did all appear there? The first reason I need to understand, first thing I need to understand is R is a vector. There are four numbers in there. What I need to do is I need to pick out only the imaginary part. Okay? So that's what I do first. Here I do imaginary of R. So I pass R to a function called INAG, which extracts only the imaginary part. Now I can just run this. I M A G R. 
you see that is that. Okay, so it extracts that memory file, but it doesn't print it out. It passes it to the next function that is calling it in this particular case, that is add. Okay, so what is add going to do? Take the absolute value of all of them. Because some of them could be positive, some of them could be negative here. Okay, so I could then take this and pass it to, oops, add. And we can guess, it just makes the absolute value of all. Okay, and then what do I do? What do I have next? That result goes to, uh, Comparison. Okay, so the next thing that is uh, happening is is this I'm subtracting it from 0.75. Why am I subtracting it from 0.75? Because that is my target. So are all the, the difference between the imaginary part of those numbers and 0.75, I'm finding that difference. And I'm asking is that difference greater than 0.0001? The severity, what does it mean? It means all the imaginary parts are far away from 0.75 by a margin larger than 0 0.0001. Okay? So, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm doing, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm doing the absolute value of the distance. Okay? So, I guess what I showed you is not quite right here. Yeah. Okay. Here we have a programmer. Do you want to come and explain this? <laughs> okay, so I'm taking, you have to match the parenthesis carefully. Okay, I'm taking, first I'm taking the imaginary part, and the result is subtracted from 0.7, and then if you see the matching parenthesis, that result is passed to the absolute value. So I'm taking the absolute value of the difference between the root and 0.75, okay? And then I'm asking the question, is this greater than 0.001, okay? So that's what, that result is being passed to all. So at this stage, the answer, there will be four numbers. And what will those four numbers be? So take this and execute that. Okay, so uh, let me repeat. I'm taking the root, passing it to IMAG, getting the imaginary part, subtracting it from 0.75, so that now I know how far away I am from 0.75, from all the roots, imaginary part. And I could be on the right hand side or I could be on the left hand side, meaning plus or minus. So at this point, I'm flipping it. I'm taking the absolute value. Once I have the absolute value, I will have the distance from 0.75, how far I am. And I want that distance to be very small, so that I'm close enough to 0.75. So if the distance is greater than 0, 0, 0, 0001, now the question to you is, what is the result of this going to be when I hit enter? True false, because now I'm doing it greater than 5. Okay, that means I'm, a log I'm doing a logical comparison. So it's going to be true or false. So it's saying all of them are true. That means all of them are greater than 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.00001 away from Point seven five. They're all too far. Okay, that means I need to keep continuing. Okay, so that is the logic in that statement. While all other roots are farther away from point seven five, the imaginary part of all the roots are farther away from point seven five. Keep searching for them. Okay, so the next, so within, then it's going to exhibit whatever is happening within that. So what does the next loop do? The far loop. Starts from the minimum and increases to the maximum in case tap. Each time it calls a rookie occurs with the current value of k. Okay, the current value of k is picked up from the loop counter. And then comes another piece of logic. Okay, so let me just run through this part. Okay, so here I have a value of k which is 29, the value of the roots, the four roots. And I know that I am in that range, okay? I'm searching for it. So, 
once the condition is satisfied in 23, I would have found it. So I would get out of the loop. Okay. So until the condition is met, it's going to be an indefinite kind of a loop. But what am I doing in line 26? Good question. It just orders it exactly. Okay. So we can say sort. Two, three, two, five, one, something like that. Okay. That's what sort you would think would do, right? But sort gives you a bit more of information, and that information is important. That appears on the left hand side of the sort command. So sort will take a range of numbers and sort them and give them in the started order in S, but it also gives you something called an index. What do you think index will tell you? Well, again, you can call it anything you want. Uh, let me keep this simple. Three, one, four. Let me that and see whether we can decipher it. Original position. The index tells you the original position where that number was. The S gives you the sorted numbers. Okay, if you have three numbers, it sorts them and returns the numbers in the order of one, three, four. But if you also want to know where was one originally, okay, the index tells you originally one was in number two position. Okay, and that is useful to know where the numbers are coming from. And both are used. This is going to take you longer than uh, what I've kind of tried to explain. So you need to go back and study this and play with it to understand the full power of uh, some of these commands. Simple commands are very powerful, routinely used in kind of the search procedures. Okay, so that's what sort that. Take a set of numbers, sort them, but not only it gives the sort of numbers, it gives the original position of where those numbers were in the second argument. So what are we doing with that understanding in line 26? I'm taking again the imaginary part, subtracting it from 0.75, take the absolute value. I don't know why I have two absolute values here, probably one is redundant, and then stop them. Okay? Why do I want to do that? Because the four roots could be in any order. The fourth root could be 0.75. Right? So I need to pick which is the road that is closest to 0.75 and see whether it has reached close enough to the tolerance that I want. So these are the two things I need to do. The roads could be in any order. I need to find out which is the road that was closest to 0.75. Okay? And that's what I'm doing uh, in line 27. Okay? So once again, index 1. Index 1 tells me what would index 1 have? If I type, for example, index 1, it will have 2, right? Because that is, that is the number that is stored in index 1. But what does that tell me? That tells me that the second root had the smallest value in this case, 3, 1, 4. Second one had the smallest value, right? So in the same way in this program, whatever that number happens to be in the first index position, that is the root that has the uh, shortest distance to 0.75. Okay. So I am then checking whether there is still less than 0.75. Okay. If there is still less than 0.75, what do we need to do? Remember, what I'm doing is I'm starting from some value of k29 and increasing it. And I know as I increase it, the root approaches 0.75. Right? So I want to see whether it is still less than 0.75. If it is still less than uh, 0.75, I need to make it go up and repeat that. Okay, and if this condition is true, if any one of those roots okay, is less than 0.75, so if any one of those conditions is less than 0.75, that means I have crossed the threshold. 
Okay, so I want to come back and redo that scanning. Instead of going from 29 to 36, I'll do, for example, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. Between 33 and 34, this change occurs. So I need to go back to 33, start going in terms of 33, 33.1, 33.2, 33.3, instead of 0.1. Okay? And that's what I'm setting up here. So I'm setting the starting point as the previous step, maximum as the next step, and then decreasing my step by factor of 10. Okay? And I'm going to go through this loop again. So these are the two logic that you need to understand here. The first one to set up the while loop, and the second one to do the interval halving in the if loop. Okay? So let me just go through this, and you'll see where the logic flows. Now, what do you think the value of k is? 30. It's going for the next value. Okay? And it hasn't noticed a sign change. It hasn't crossed the 0.75. Okay? Now it is doing a value of 34. Okay? Now it has crossed. Between 34 and 35, we already saw the same changes, okay? So it's coming into this loop that's detected that it has gone from 0.745 to maybe 0.755. It has changed, okay? So now I need to go back and reset k min and k max and the k step. Okay? Now where do you think it will go? Where should the loop go back? The while loop, okay? So now it's going to at the process, but in terms of steps of point 0.1. So what is k step? Point 0.1. What is k min? 34. What is k max? 35. Okay. So it's actually a very nice piece of code that automates this process and can give you answer to how many significant digits would I get from this loop? Four significant digits. Okay. So let me just set up the break point there and continue. So we've gone through the loop and it would have printed on the workspace what is the value of k. Okay, where is the, what's the, the k value with an imaginary part of 0.75 is 34.45. Okay. And now this is quite a bit of uh, programming, but to answer that particular question, in a rigorous manner, you need to write a code like this. Otherwise, it's not really find out those values of k for which you get exactly 0.75. Any questions on that? I, I, I know where you are going. <laughs> you have rather two problems that's important for the exam. <laughs> right? It's beneficial, believe me. <laughs> it is beneficial. <laughs> not for the exam, not for the exam. How many of you feel totally lost? Three times. This is the end of the course. I'm not <laughs> going to hold you responsible for learning these things. Totally lost? How many of you? Are... <laughs> that, 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 that is a fair statement. Okay? <laughs> That is a fair statement. But does not mean that you shouldn't want to be exposed to this? Okay. Because that's part of learning. Are, I know from at this vantage point you just want to prepare for the exam and get it over with. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> for me, learning is more than doing well in the exam. Okay. So that's why. I, 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 I guess I use this last opportunity to show you the power of MATLAB. And it is an example taken from a book. 
and there are parts of that question that could be in an exam. I could always rephrase it in a way that it doesn't involve MATLAB programming. So all I have talked about in the last half an hour, I tell you that you're not going to be examined in MATLAB. I'm not going to ask you to write a code that will solve this problem in MATLAB. The best thing that, that is done in the best way in a computer exam. Okay, that's not going to have. So in that sense, I can believe your concern in the sense that this is not going to be in the exam. But what you're asking, the other question I guess is, are all the other problems are going to be like this? Because then you're saying that it may be a waste of time to put it in the right way. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I'm aware of that. I know that. Right? And uh, but my, my take on, I guess, teaching and learning is somewhat different. Uh, it's an opportunity to expose you to something that you have not seen. That's what this learning is, right? And. Uh, you're not going to be examined on this, but that doesn't mean that there is no value. The value is not immediate. Okay. Okay. So. I don't mean to like put down somebody in the way, because I mean I understand the code. I just understood it might be wrong. But the the concepts that we are talking about today, in terms of how many roots there are, are how many such k values will there be for a specific value of the root? Those are more general questions that you should, because these are concepts, okay? This has nothing to do with the programming. So those you should be aware of and you will be examined, okay? But in terms of uh, writing a code like this, it's not part of that. Part of that. And the other problem, if you talk, I'm not going to cover any more new material after I finish, to, I guess I finished, so I need another lecture to talk about controller tuning. Okay, and after that, in the last lecture, if you want to bring some problems, we'll be glad to discuss them. Okay, if you don't, then I'll bring some problems and discuss them. I'll make sure that they don't have any problems. Okay. That's that's what I want to prepare you when you go. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you have these notes somewhere, it might come handy. So I will upload all these programs. I will upload those programs, yeah. Okay, I guess we'll stop there.